evangelism comes from a Greek term meaning bringing the good news. So fundamentally what an evangelist does is brings the good news. And so with Macintosh, the good news was that this personal computer can increase your creativity and productivity. The good news with Canva was that this product can increase your ability to communicate by a democratizing design. That's the good news. My podcast can help you become a remarkable person because you listen to what other remarkable people have done and how they did it. That's the good news of my podcast. So what an evangelist does is bring the good news of his or her product. Now, this assumes that your product is good news. <laughs> so if you don't have a product that is good news, it's very hard to use evangelism to make it successful. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissecting the pulse of business technology and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leung, and if you're a podcaster like me, you'll be making social media assets from YouTube banners to colorful infographics using Canva. With me today is a very renowned guest, Guy Kawasaki, the chief evangelist from Canva, but I've known him since the early 2000s with his book, The Art of the Start, I think 2.0 now, and also recently, Wise Guy. So, Guy, many thanks and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I had no idea we go so far back. Yes, I met your partner then, Bill Reichardt, in Cambridge, yeah. UK. But I think this is probably 20 years later, so we can now have this conversation between us. <laughs> but I think for I our listeners... looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I think for our listeners out there who may not know you, can you briefly introduce yourself and the journey to how you become the chief product evangelist in Canva? I know a lot of people know about all the startup books you write, even your days as an evangelist at Apple as well. And how far back do you want me to go? As far back as you like. <laughs> <laughs> how long does this podcast last? <laughs> it's a long form, so it can go an hour. <laughs> no, no, or even longer. So I was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii. I went to school at Stanford. And after Stanford, I went to law school for two weeks and quit. I went to UCLA for an MBA the next year. I actually started my career really in the jewelry business. And after a few years, my Stanford classmate hired me into the Macintosh division of Apple and in the Macintosh division of Apple, I was Apple's second software evangelist. So my job was to convince companies to create Macintosh software and hardware. I stayed at Apple for about four years. Then I left to start a company. I returned th about three years later. I became Apple's chief evangelist. Then I left that to start another company. I became a writer and a speaker. I started a venture capital firm. And today, fast forward now, I am chief evangelist of Canva and I am the host of the Remarkable People podcast. So you were at Apple, then you write books, run a venture capital firm. What drives you to continue to evolve and learn in the tech space? Because I think <laughs> coming from a selling jewelry background to selling software is very different, right? <laughs> yeah, well... I have four kids, so I had a lot of tuition to pay. That's why I had to keep working. I just, I fall in love with stuff. I fell in love with Macintosh, fell in love with Canva. I fell in love with podcasting and writing. So I can't tell you that I had a master plan that laid out my direction and laid out what I was going to do. It just went from one thing to another rather unpredictably. I recall watching a TED talk that you give about wise guys. So I'm. this is one question that a lot of my audience liked is that they always want to know what are the lessons that you learn from your career journey. So maybe if you were to summarize, what are the key lessons that you can share with my audience about your career journey? Well, I mean, I've written entire books about my career journey. Mm. So I mean, we could go a long time mm. on this question. So if you how about, say distill down to the, like, the three most important ones. 
Okay. So in no particular order, I think lesson number one is your existing customer cannot tell you how to innovate. They can tell you how to evolve. They can tell you how to make things better, faster, and cheaper, but they cannot tell you how to get to the next curve. So you could not ask an Apple II owner how to make a Macintosh. You really, you couldn't ask a Macintosh owner how to make iOS. And so it takes those kinds of leaps. It would be like asking someone who used Kodak film to describe digital photography. I just, I have a hard time believing that could have been done. So that's number one. Number two, I think the most important skill for an entrepreneur is empathy. That is to understand what it's like to be your customer. And you can do this by watching your customer. You can do this by going through the same experience as your customer. And empathy becomes compassion when you not only feel what your customer feels, but you also are now willing to do something. So a compassionate person is willing to do something. You don't just feel bad or feel sad. So empathy is the second thing. And the third thing I would say is never ask people to do something that you yourself would not do. So, you know, if you're telling your employees to fly from San Francisco to Beijing or Melbourne and you're telling them, oh, you know, you got to fly coach. Well, then if they're flying coach, you better fly coach, too. You should not ask them to do something you wouldn't do. And that goes for customers, employees, partners, everybody. In view of like thinking of all these lessons, right? I think one of the questions, like for example, empathy for a user, for to think about the user, right? Is it very important to really be so customer centric? How do you avoid being customer blind then? Well, if it were easy, then more people would do it. Now, mm. now there's kind of two theories, extreme ends. So one is what I said, empathy, understand the customer work backwards from what the customer wants as opposed to forward from what you want, what you like to do, what you have been doing, what you're good at doing, right? So Kodak was good at making film, selling chemicals, this kind of thing. And it just happened that for a while, doing what they could do and like to do was successful selling film. But if you think about it, if you work backwards from the customer, what the customer really wants to do is preserve memories as opposed to buy chemicals. And so it's very important to work backwards. So it's this kind of thinking that helps you remain relevant. And it's so that's one extreme. OK, this is the mm. empathy, understand your customer, feel for them, be them. The other extreme, I would say, is the Steve Jobs approach, which is he makes whatever the hell he wants, and then he convinces you that you want it too. That can work, but you need to be Steve Jobs, and there are not a lot of Steve Jobs in this world. Well, I, I could still recall that I think you made that quote that you, he should stop selling sugar software before he returned to Apple, <laughs> right? The actual, the famous quote is when... Steve Jobs was trying to recruit John Scully away from Pepsi. That's right. And he kind of told, I, mean, I wasn't there, but you know, <laughs> this is what I heard. He told John Scully, well, do you want to spend the rest of your life spent selling sugared water or do you want to change the world by increasing people's creativity and productivity? I want to get into the subject of the main subject of day, which I want to talk to you about Canva and also want to pick your brain a lot about product evangelism because you are really okay. someone in the forefront of how to get people to adopt, use, and even get them to be really interested in it. But before that, maybe my first question is, can you introduce Canva briefly to my audience and sure. maybe share a bit of the history, mission, and vision of the company with my sure. audience? Sure. So I have been affiliated with Canva for about 10 years now. And the gist of Canva is that it has democratized design. And it used to be that design was like many other skills, including IT. 
it was kind of a a protected bastion, right? Where you had to get this advanced degree, you had to be skilled in these trained things, you had to use high-end software that you spent years perfecting. Sounds like IT, right? You need a mm. degree, you need experience, you need to use these special tools. And what Canva did is it said, you know what? Anybody should be able to become a better communicator by creating beautiful graphics. And so the start of Canva was helping people make beautiful graphics just as social media was kicking in. And social media is highly dependent on beautiful graphics. So it was perfect timing for Canva to create basically a democratized version of Photoshop. So it's Photoshop for the rest of us. One of the things that really stood out for Canva, at least for me as a user, I, I'm considered probably a majority, the late majority that got into using it. But I think the part that I don't need to learn Adobe Photoshop, I don't need to learn all the different tools, but I just able to just pick, choose, do, make it, make yeah. it that logo. I remember making the YouTube video page banner. Right. And then I right. was for my podcast here. So it's, it just makes it very simple. Yeah. On well, that. what the key here is that uh, the Photoshop vision is you start with a blank page and you, I mean, there's hundreds of Photoshop tools and you literally can do everything. The Canva vision is there are certain categories, presentation, Instagram, YouTube, Etsy, you know, that th there's these services that have standardized optimal graphic dimensions. Instagram is square, right? <laughs> something else might be nine by 12. And so you take something like the category of presentations. Now inside the category of nine by 12 presentations, is it nine by 12 or six by nine? I forget. <laughs> anyway, so inside this category of presentations, Canva has hundreds of templates already done. Now, Obviously, those templates don't have the same text that you want because we're not clairvoyant. Mm. Although with AI, it's getting closer. But anyway, so there's these hundreds of templates. And you pick a template, you change the text, you add your photos. And I swear, in the time it would take to probably learn Photoshop and get it out of the box. Well, not learn. The time it takes to boot Photoshop, you could create a graphic in Canva. Which you already alluded earlier, generative AI. So I have now mid-journey, stable diffusion. I could prompt. Does it supercharge it? Or does it maybe even making Canva now going on steroids, for example, for the normal user like you well, and me making graphics? I am a writer, okay? And so I think this is a very similar use case of AI. And as a writer, some people say, oh, AI is going to replace writing because you just tell ChatGPT, write me a thousand words on how to be innovative. And ChatGPT like that can generate that, right? So that's at one extreme. On the other hand, if I were writing a post about how to be innovative, I have four or five ideas in my head. I put those four or five down. I asked ChatGPT, what are the 10 key points for innovation? ChatGPT spits back 10. I look at my four, ChatGPT's 10, and you know there's probably 90% overlap, but there's one or two that ChatGPT mentioned and I didn't. Now, I'm not going to just copy and paste the whole thing from ChatGPT and make it my post. I'm going to say, oh, ChatGPT mentioned this. I didn't. I got the idea from ChatGPT. And so now I incorporate that idea in my writing. And I think that in a sense, design works like that. This is my idea. I need someone standing by the side of the river eating a Peking duck well, good luck finding that at Getty Photo. So it can help you supplement. But I think the core is still the writer or the designer. And don't get me wrong. AI has made me a much better writer. Okay. Mm. I think AI will make people much better designers. 
Do you think it augments rather than replace? You are spot on on that. You just basically use it as kind of a reflection to see what are the other configurations you may be able to write right. in your article, but it's not necessarily writing that article itself. You can do, have it do sort of what if, right? And it can also do mundane things like find me a synonym. And obviously there was thesaurus.com before AI, but with thesaurus.com, you go and you say, okay, give me the synonym for innovative. Well, with chat GPT, you can say, give me another way to say state of the art. So it's not just one word one synonym. You can give it a concept and you can say, well, I want to express the concept of being remarkable. Give me words or phrases that mean the same thing. And so it it broadens the choices to you. And as I would assume, it broadens the choices in the design efforts. And so I Listen, I am a total 110% believer in AI, and I think it's going to make my writing better. It's going to make designing better. If you really want to know what I think, I think AI may save humankind. I think humankind is just screwing up civilization so bad that AI may be our savior. So here's the interesting part, right? That means there's no danger for writers, designers, or even developers because actually AI augments rather than replace. From what right. I think I've been observing and what you have been saying, that AI actually do more good than harm. Is that where I get the message? That's what I would say, yes. Now, I think one of the problems with how people approach AI, for one thing, many journalists they're looking for this worst case to write an interesting article, right? So it's not interesting anymore to say, AI, help me write. They want to find AI, I gave it some prompts, and next thing you know, it was a Nazi essay. So it turned me into a Nazi. That's the danger of AI. But that's because people m use prompts in order to get AI to do it. And, you know, it, and if it says, okay, so I use ChatGPT and all of a sudden it said, launch nuclear missiles at Russia. Well, I would like to see the prompt that made that happen. But, you know, what I think is what people miss is that they're not comparing apples against apples. So they're saying we're going to take the best of humans and the worst of machines and we're going to compare it. So extreme example, using nuclear war, you say, oh, AI could become all controlling and it's just going to decide one day to launch a nuclear attack between America and Russia, right? Because these machines are going to take over. We can't just pull the plug. They're going to start a nuclear war. That's why we cannot go to AI. Well, may I point out that there are three or four individuals in the world who might start a nuclear war any day now, right? And so you're saying AI is going to start a nuclear war, but all humans are reasonable, intelligent, and peace-loving. So humans would never start a nuclear war. AI will. That's total bullshit. If you had a choice of saying, okay, we're going to let Vladimir Putin or Kim Jong-un or Donald Trump control nuclear missiles or chat GPT. Wow. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. It's not so clear. You would say, yeah, I'd rather Donald Trump have his hand on the nuclear football than chat GPT. See, you really got me started now. Mm -hmm. So in America, there's a presidential candidate named Ron DeSantis. And he's truly a conservative, trying to control what's thought, taught in schools, women's rights, voting rights, all this kind of stuff, just hardcore control, all that stuff. And he and his party do not believe in teaching black history and slavery because, I don't know, they think it's going to somehow harm white kids and affect them mentally and cause distress and distress and all that. So one day I went to ChatGPT and I said, should we teach the history of slavery? 
chat GPT says yes and gives you five reasons. Okay. I tell you what, go ask Ron DeSantis, should we teach the history of slavery? He's going to say no. Who would you rather have as president of the United States? Yeah, I guess that's the that is something that I think is much more provocative I, and much more interesting in the sense that there are things that AI is learning that is not necessarily always the bad. It's just the way how people are prompting it. But I want to get the conversation back to something that I've always <laughs> been very curious about. Okay, I'm very curious about this. I think I'm always very curious about what the role of a product evangelist or chief evangelist of a company. So can you actually explain yeah. what you do and then why is sure. it crucial for like companies like Apple, Canva to have that product evangelist? Okay, so evangelism comes from a Greek term meaning bringing the good news. So fundamentally what an evangelist does is brings the good news. And so with Macintosh, the good news was that this personal computer can increase your creativity and productivity. The good news with Canva was that this product can increase your ability to communicate by a democratizing design. That's the good news. My podcast can help you become a remarkable person because you listen to what other remarkable people have done and how they did it. That's the good news of my podcast. So what an evangelist does is bring the good news of his or her product. Now, this assumes that your product is good news. <laughs> so if you don't have a product that is good news, it's very hard to use evangelism to make it successful. So what is the one thing that you know about being a product evangelist that not many people know? Is it just that? Is always the good news. I don't know if there's anything I know that everybody else doesn't know. I mean, I, in a sense, I spent my career trying to help everybody understand evangelism. But, but I mean, it is very important that you evangelize something great. And, and I'm not saying evangelism is the only way to succeed with a new product, okay? It is a way. It's particularly good when it captures the hearts and minds of people because they see that, wow, Macintosh is so easy to use. I'm more creative and productive. Canva is so easy to use. I can communicate better and I can design beautiful graphics. That's the kind of product. I mean, Elon Musk has gone off the rails a little bit here, but you know, when people first encountered Tesla, they were evangelists for Tesla, right? They said, oh, this is a car that doesn't pollute the air. That's good news. And so if you want to have evangelists and use evangelism, you got to have good news. Now, there are products that they may not be good news, but they're neutral news, right? And in those cases, you can introduce a product based on corporate standards, based on cost effectiveness, based on other variables. But evangelism is all about good news. So if I were to take your good news, that piece, and then move to build a community, so it's yeah. building the community, it's just bringing good news to the community. But what are the other things, what are the aspects where the evangelists yeah. use to actually build other so, communities? You know, if your product is good enough news, mm -hmm. I think it's the case that you cannot prevent a community from forming, even if you tried. <laughs> Okay, people are going to just love what you do. They're going to start Macintosh user groups, Tesla user groups, stuff like that. The community will build around it. Now, that's all great. But imagine if you understood that and you accelerated and expanded that. And so what does a community need from a company like Apple? They need support. They need technical information. They need kind of the warm and fuzzies in the sense of Apple recognizes that this is a community that is valuable. It's, it's just like Porsche has the Porsche Club of America. And I mean, every car company, Harley Davidson has the Harley owners groups, right? 
And those are community groups that companies have recognized that help the company. Uh, does it also involve the br- having that brand as well? Like, I mean, Apple has a brand. Porsche or well, Ferrari owners also have a brand. So that's something that the brand is actually somehow a reflection of that. Yeah, I mean, you say that in a way that kind of implies that, oh, one day we figured out, oh, we got to have a brand. Duh, let's just go buy one, right? But the way a brand works, I think, is that a brand develops based on the perceptions of your customers of a product that can be good or bad. So the way Apple got its brand is by shipping great products. Tesla got its brand. Canva got its brand. I mean, don't get me wrong. You can think you sit in Sydney or you sit in Cupertino or you sit in Fremont and you can control the minds around the world. You would be deceiving yourself, right? So the way a brand develops is you ship and you hope people love it and they form their own opinion. I think to some extent, you can slightly move the brand perception, but you know, you cannot turn a pig into <laughs> a peacock. That's just the way it is. So if you took an extreme example, You can hire the smartest marketing people in the world, spend tens of millions of dollars, and you can try to make cigarettes safe and cool in the minds of people. You ain't going to do it. It ain't going to happen. Cigarettes are not good news. So it really goes down to the product. Does it have a kind of inspiration, aspirational value or the value to do good? I think product is 80% of the battle. Yeah. And I'm a marketer telling you that. Yeah, I get that point. So like, for example, in, in your case, you have your Remarkable People podcast, right? Yeah. So when you talk about the good news, you're trying to bring people to believe that they can be that. So from talking to all these people, Remarkable People, what are the like most interesting things that you find that you have not previously learned after you yeah. did this podcast? Well, I think one of the things I truly learned is that Being remarkable is not something that you are born with or someone bestows upon you, right? I mean, your parents could be the most remarkable PhD, Nobel Prize, MacArthur Fellows. And now, obviously, there's some component of intelligence that's inherited, but it doesn't mean that just because you are the son or daughter of these truly remarkable people that you will be remarkable. Most likely you're going to be a spoiled brat. So what I learned is that it takes, I think, years of work. And I've divided my book into three sections. So there's growth, meaning that you embrace new skills, new topics, new subjects. There's grit, which means you work hard. And then there's graciousness. So I think those are the three components of being remarkable. You got to grow. You got to expand your mind. You got to work your ass off. And with those two things, you also have to be kind and honest and compassionate, i.e. gracious. Mm. But very different from how people are thinking about tech these days, right? They're always thinking about grow at the expense of everything. Well, I don't know if everybody thinks that way, but yes. And listen, there are not too many remarkable venture capitalists. Let's just put it (laughs) that way. (laughs) Reflecting on the product evangelism, what are the do not stand? Like what are the red flags that you think that if somebody, is it just bad news? Like if the product is bad news or if the service is bad news, then maybe you shouldn't do any product evangelism at all. And are you saying that you are a, potential customer or that you are actually the company that's making this thing? The company. If the company makes something, as you said, it must bring good news, right? If it doesn't, then what could you do? I mean, what would be the red flag to say maybe we shouldn't have an evangelist at all? I suspect that it is an artificial question in the sense that you're describing a situation where a company has a piece of crap 
but is trying to evangelize it. I would say that if a company has a piece of crap, it's very unlikely it would ever even think to evangelize it. They're going to sell on margin, on cost, on commission, on bonuses, on spiffs, on monopoly, on getting the government to bless theirs and not their competition. I don't know. (laughs) It ain't going to be evangelism. Since we are in a conversation about podcasts relating to Asia, I think this is just one part that I would just want to understand. Is like, for example, Canvas mission has sort of empower the world to design. Can you talk about how, even in your role as an evangelist, how do you see this intersecting with, say, the rise of digital economies in Asia or maybe even in other parts of the world then? Whenever there's radical change, the incumbent is often at a disadvantage. You mean, you would think that IBM making mainframe computers would have the expertise, factory, brand, et cetera, et cetera, to dominate the personal computer business. And you would think that Adobe, with its domination of high-end graphics, could easily say, okay, now we're going to empower the low end, the entry level too. I can't tell you I know of an example of something like that. And so when a digital economy happens as opposed to an analog economy or based on steam or based on carbon-based fuels or something, whenever there's a step function like that, I think that's a great leveler and it creates opportunities for new companies. And that's a good thing. So I guess one interesting question I always have, because I use Canva sometimes, like it offers quite a lot of tools, design template for someone who have no experience. How does it decide whether, what features to add or expand to? Because you are the evangelist, you deal with the community, there will be requests coming from different people. How do you communicate that? Not just at Canva, but this is a challenge for every company particularly every tech company, because the expectation for change in software is probably faster than, you know, you're not going to change an airplane in six months (laughs) and Mm -hmm. redo how a Boeing 787 is made because some customers said the seats are too shallow or too narrow or whatever, right? You're not going to just rip out the seats. So I think it's a combination of the vision of the employees. How did they foresee people using Canva? And it's also simultaneously and oftentimes a contradiction that you have this idea, uh, uh, this perfect idea, but then the real world says, you know what? I mean, we need this feature. We need this to operate one way. I mean, let's t- maybe you had this idea that you were going to make PowerPoint obsolete. I'm not saying this happened, but this is a hypothetical, right? So let's say you had this idea that you're going to make PowerPoint obsolete and people are going to use a new product to do presentations. So that's your vision. But, you know, you come to find out, oh my God, every meeting, every board, every executive off-site, every, everything, every meeting planner, every, everybody is using PowerPoint. So it's not like, hey, we got something better than PowerPoint, throw away Microsoft Office and jump on this new thing. So that's why with Canva, you can import and export in the PowerPoint format, right? And so you design in Canva, This is what I do for my presentations. I design in Canva. I export to PowerPoint. Because when I make a speech and the host organization says, I need your presentation in advance, I make it in Canva. I export to PowerPoint. And they're happy, right? I don't have to convince them that, no, you got to change this or I can only send you a PDF or whatever. Because... When you come right down to it, when you go to that 
convention center and there's 10,000 people in the front and there's 10 in the back. The 10 in the back, they have two Windows machines, one for the slide and one for the video, and then they have backups. You're not going to go back there and say, listen, I only have this format that runs on Mac that you need to have this special application. That just is not going to work. So this is like a real world problem that you may have this grand vision, but the reality is you got to export to PowerPoint. And of course, you can also export the keynote, I hope. <laughs> Since I'm a keynote user. But in any case, I will be very curious as a traditional closing question. What does great look like for Canva moving forward in the next couple of years? Great for Canva in the next few years. We want to democratize design. We want to empower people to be better communicators through design. We started with really social media graphics and we've expanded across the board presentations, documents. And now there's this great new tool to power our users called artificial intelligence, where we can help you make graphics better and faster and easier and cheaper. So I think it's a continuation of that, that basically we want to make you better communicators in every way that we can. Guy, many thanks for coming on the show. And I, in traditional closing, I have three questions. But the first one is, I know you're speaking in the upcoming South by Southwest, Sydney. What yes. would be the things you are looking forward to? I love Sydney. <laughs> I mean, I truly, I've been to Sydney, I don't know how many times because of Canva. And here's, do most of your users live in Australia and Sydney or all over Asia? All over Asia Pacific. But I think there will be oh. a lot of them going to South by Southwest Sydney. Okay. Well, first of all, I owe so much to Australia. I'm deaf, so I owe my cochlear implant to Australia. I owe my living to Australia, Canva. I use external portable monitor called Espresso. I owe that to Australia. And so, I, obviously, I have a humongous sense of obligation and gratitude towards Australia. And South by Southwest is by far my favorite conference. I used to tell people, it's the only conference you don't have to pay me to go to. And so this is my favorite conference in my favorite city. How are you going to beat that? I mean, so I, I am so thrilled to be coming to Sydney for South by Southwest. Any recommendations that have inspired you recently, like a TV show, book, or anything else? Oh, inspiration. Um, I'm going to go with an old classic. She might not like that description, but I've interviewed about 200 people in my podcast. And I would have to say that probably the most remarkable person I interviewed is Jane Goodall. So you cannot go wrong listening to Jane Goodall. <laughs> yep. I agree. Yep. <laughs> and how can my audience find you? Your books, your podcasts, everything else? Yeah. If you go to GuyKawasaki.com, that's where everything is. I am really active on LinkedIn, Twitter slash X slash Exeter or whatever he's calling it. Not so active anymore. I have been active on threads. Do you, do you use threads? Yeah. How do you feel about threads? It's still in its early stages i think it's yeah. also network effects i think in asia it's much more difficult to get a kind of network conversations as compared to yeah. say in the us so yeah. twitter yeah. is still x is still better i'm testing blue sky at the moment and mastodon as well but i think they are all pretty similar as well yeah. at the moment yeah i think it's not going to be easy for threads to ultimately survive. I've been through the Clubhouse and Google Plus experience, right? So it's one thing to start fast. It's another thing to finish strong. <laughs> I, I think you have nailed that actually much earlier by saying, does the product deliver good news? And I still yeah. haven't find what is the good news that Treads is giving me as compared to... Excellent, excellent point. Like, 
when I remember the first time I used Google, I went and I got my wife. I said, you have got to try this. This is so much better than any other search engine, right? And I obviously felt that about Macintosh. I felt that way about Canva. So this brings us back to this evangelism question. So one of the real tests of evangelism, is it your best interests or the other person's best interests, right? So if I'm a sales rep for a company and I tell you to use my product, is it because it's good for me or good for you? Most of the time it's because of good for me. But with Google, I mean, I wasn't a Google stockholder. With Macintosh, I was, Canva, I was, well, I became a Canva shareholder. I didn't start out that way. And I, with Twitter, when Twitter started, I went out and I told people, you got to join. It. This is so cool. I must admit, I did the same thing with Google+. Plus. I thought Google+, Plus was really well done. Obviously, I didn't exactly pick a winner there. But with Threads... I have not asked any of my family to get on threads. I have not asked any of my friends. I have a producer at my podcast. I asked her to get on threads to use it as a tool to promote my podcast. But she is the only person I told to get on threads and she didn't listen to me. (laughs) So that's coming back to what you said, which is like if... Not that my wife would ever ask me this, but if my wife would ask me, honey, why should I get on threads? I really, I don't have an answer. I mean, what am I going to say? Well, it's like Twitter, except there's no Nazis on it yet. That ain't going to (laughs) work. Yeah, I think, I think as well, but you know, it's interesting. I have a Threads account for my podcast, but I don't actively do much on it. So I think you pointed it out pretty succinctly. It's about the good news. So for all the yeah. listeners out there, just subscribe to us on YouTube and probably x.com or maybe even LinkedIn. And Guy, many thanks for coming on the show. And I look forward to speak to you at South by Southwest Sydney. Okay. I'll see you there. We'll go have sushi under the Sydney Bridge at that great Japanese place. (laughs) Okay, thank you very much. All the best to you. Bye.